Hello, this is Triad Media Presents, and I'm Frank Beecham. This is a series of programs featuring people in the arts and entertainment. Today, our guest is Harvey Brooks, master bass player on more albums than you can imagine. His new book is View from the Bottom. Harvey first came to the public's attention 55 years ago this week when he played on the classic Bob Dylan album Highway, 50, uh, Highway 61 Revisited. Got it right now. Since then, he's played with major musicians from Miles Davis to Jimi Hendrix. He's recorded and played with The Doors, The Electric Flag, Al Cooper, Richie Havens, Mike Bloomfield, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Eric Anderson, Judy Collins, Tom Rush, and, and then on and on. So I, uh, I want to, uh, also, he played at Monterey Pop and was a producer at Columbia Records. Um, before we go any further, um, you might notice on the book that my name is on the cover under Harvey's, and that's because I helped him write it. It was probably the most fun I've ever had in my life, and it was a really great experience. So we're speaking to Harvey from his home in Jerusalem. And before we get to the music questions, I want to ask Harvey, how are you handling the pandemic? What's it been like there? Well, to be honest, Frank, I've been working on this book for a few years, three years with my wife, Bonnie, and we've got a routine. and. We get up at 5.30 in the morning, we walk the dogs, get breakfast together, we do uh, have our little meeting about the day. And so it's, it's an insanity what's going on in the world, and it's happening everywhere. But for us, in our little bubble, we're good, you know, uh, uh, just keeping our routine all day long, every day. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, I want to, because we don't. We have about a half hour here, and I've got a lot of ground to cover. So you wrote in the beginning of the book that you were in the right place at the right time. But your success reflects that there had to be more than just luck. And I wonder, what is it that you kept bringing to the groups that you played with over the years? Well, it's, it goes like this. The right place at the right time. Well, the right place... Someone knocks on your door, you answer. And if you answer well and consistent, you get a lot of calls. Uh, for, for me, it, every piece of music, every project I get involved with, I put my heart in it. So I want it to be good. I want everybody with me to sound good, and I do everything I can to help them. I react to what they're playing. I, I'm not trying to tell them what to do. I'm listening and they're reacting. And I think that's one of the big reasons that uh, I've been able to uh, be involved in the projects I have been involved in. Right, right. In high school, you started to play with a group called the Citations. And a friend convinced you to switch from guitar to electric bass and even bought you one. Your group played at local dances, church functions, and whatever. And in that period, you befriended Al Cooper. And after high school, you played clubs all over New York. And in 1964, you got a gig at the New York World's Fair with Al. And that led to Al repaying the favor by getting you on the Bob Dylan gig. Will you tell us about what that was like? Well, no, just very quickly. Uh, Eric Krakow was a bass player who was playing with Al in Queens. We all came from Queens. And Eric was going off to college or somewhere to be a dentist. And so he gave my name to Al. That's how I met Al. And we started to play and go into the city. Uh, this band of citations. Uh, Sid Davidoff was a politician, used our band for his politics. And he became our manager. So he would you know, have a little political party here and bring us down. We had no idea what was going on. But within that, well, we had two guitars, bass, and drums. Electric bass was just starting to be something. And, and Sid said, well, you play electric bass now because 
is a more experienced guitar player. So I became an electric bass player uh, within the band and started to play. Uh, he got us a couple of gigs in Greenwich Village. We played the Ace Wonder, Trudy Heller's, Peppermint Lounge, all of these kind of things on East uh, in the village. And uh, it was an amazing experience. I was playing six nights a week. I guess I was 19 years old. And I just played all the time. I learned all these songs. And I, I, it gave me a vocabulary. So Al and I got to do a, a number of things together. We got this band together called the Club Men. And uh, I got contacted by a friend that the... Uh, a place called Carousel Park within the World's Fair was uh, into the band. So we came and played. I took the gig, called Al up, a couple of other guys, and we all alternated with a carousel that would spin around. Then we would come on and play. And uh, that was the gig. Uh, and then uh, I was out playing with uh, another group in Manhattan at a club. And I got a call from Al in between sets, saying that I just did this session with uh, a guy named Bob Dylan. Uh, you know, uh, we need a bass player. The guy's not working out. Uh, you want to do it? I didn't know who Bob Dylan was. Never heard of him. It wasn't in my thing. I was playing R&B and other kind of like pop folk. And uh, I said, okay, uh, sounds great. I'll be there. So uh, the next day, I, I came into town, uh, I think Studio B, uh, Columbia Records, uh, 777 7th Avenue, Victoria Hotel, upstairs. From there, so I go in, I take the elevator, and I walk down the hallway, big metal door in front of me, I open it up, and bam, I'm in a new world. It's, uh, this guy standing at the console listening to a song I was to learn later on it was called Like a Rolling Stone. First time I heard it, uh, I didn't play on it, uh, but it was from a previous session. Uh, and it was amazing. Cooper was there. He introduced me to Albert Grossman, Bob Dylan's manager. And uh, Dylan, you know, recognized that I existed. He said, hey, man, went back to what he was doing. And then from there, I went to the studio, and uh, it happened. Well, what what do you think that you brought to Dylan that he hadn't gotten earlier? I think he was getting a lot of studio guys who were like were very formal, you know, and, and it was a, a kind of uh, formal way of playing. Oh, great players, you know, guys that were playing sessions all day long charred upside down. Uh, but I think in me, uh, he was able to relax a little bit because I had a relaxing feel. I have a relaxing feel. It's one of my main attributes. I can take anything and just make it feel good. And I think that's what he related to. So after the album, he obviously liked it because you were invited to play at Forest Hills. Um, that was... Uh, the first time after Dylan had gone electric. What was that like? Well, the, the first gig was at the Newport Home Fest with Butterfield and Brookfield and all those guys. This was now all the ardent folk people, you know, were really up in arms because they got a taste of what was coming from their folk hero. Um, for me, it was all new stuff, you know, and folk rock was just invented, which was a combination of playing folk music with, with more of a consistent feel, you know, a, a drum feel, a figure, just consistency, rather than the random focus, which makes folk so wonderful, that randomness. And it could be eight bars or 12 bars, it could be 13 bars or 17 bars. What we were doing was kind of locking it in. That may made, that made give it an appeal, gave it an appeal to the more of the pop audience uh, because they could relate easier. 
Dylan's songs, his, his lyrics are just unbelievably incredible. All of his solo albums said a whole lot of stuff, but now with it being electric, it gave him a different attitude, invigorated his style a whole lot more. So how did the audience react when he went electric the second time? They, uh, they were not that happy. They, uh, you know, at that time, Forest Hill Stadium, there was a, a giant lawn in between the seating and the stage. And so they were far away. Uh, and I think that um, they loved Bob's opening set when he playing music. That went over real well. And uh, when we came out, you know, they would hear boos and hisses. And, and I think we won them over. Uh, but I don't think they were really ready for that yet. Uh, but I thought we did well. But uh, I don't think the audience really loved it. It's just too different. And you then you went on to the Hollywood Bowl. It changed there, right? It was different. Hollywood Bowl was different. They were more receptive. They, they seemed to be a little looser. They were not so, how do, how do we say, by the book. You know, right, the right. real dedicated folkies, it had to be this way, that way, anything else. Pete Seeger was having hemorrhoids. Um, but... In, in California with movie people and, and beach people and just a whole different environment. Uh, right, they loved it. right. They loved it. Now, a number of years later, when you were living in Woodstock, Dylan calls you, invites himself over, and you guys play chess. And right. you didn't know whether you'd ever work with him again. And shortly after that visit, you were invited to play on New Morning. His Al next Cooper. album, Al Cooper. And without, yeah. yeah. So what was uh, what was the difference then than the earlier session? Well, the earlier sessions, you know, it was at the excitement of it being new, and so it was all just what was happening then. Um, it was exciting. Things were were, were not really coming together. The folk rock sound that he was doing. Now we're we're at this next album that I'm at. And he's really got to make it happen. He's got four or five um, albums from Nashville, from here. There's a whole sound, and now there's some pressure. I felt he was like under right. He and Cooper were just like banging heads trying to get this thing to happen. And I think they came to me because. Uh, they needed that kind of feeling. And I know they had incredible other players. Uh, and I was glad to help out. Right, right. I, now, I, you I, grew I, up... I'm sorry, go go ahead. Were you finishing something there? Yeah, no, I was just saying that I think that same thing that I'm able to bring to the studio uh, happened. Uh, right, right. Now, you grew up playing in Greenwich Village, and and you were basically hanging around clubs, and you became the go-to bass player at Cafe Agogo. Uh, there you played with a whole bunch of people, like Tim Harden, Fred Neal, Phil Oates, Richie Havens. You even jammed with Otis Spann during a uh, session with Muddy Waters. By today's standards, that sounds almost impossible. What what is it that made that work in that day? Uh, that you when you were there, the music in general, all that all that kind of interplay between musicians, and it it doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, the things that were happening, the new musics, the old musics with new treatments, uh, new sounds happening, it was a, a sign of the time. It was before everything was homogenized. All the music's now has been so homogenized and formulated that uh, you know even jam bands are formulated now. You know, it's like, well, you got this, and it goes to go a certain kind of way. Um, I think that's kind of what was happening. In the 60s, the world 
there was another time of change. It's kind of what's going on now. The world is really going through some amazing changes. It's not going to be the same. I don't know what's coming out. All, all, all the people that I know, the musicians that play out, concerts or clubs, they don't know when they're going to work again. And when they do work, right. what's it going to be like? Where's it going to be? What's the money going to be like? You know, all these venues are, you know, are under pressure. So, again, it's a time of change, so it could be anything. Uh, right, right. I think... Uh, uh, in 19... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, again, uh, we're on a bit of a delay here, so... I, I, okay, and, and as far as I'm concerned, any any kind of thing that are going to... It's time. Musical growth. There are amazing musicians now. And people like me uh, coming out and giving our points of view and trying to pass on our experiences because it's coming around to those same times again. It's rise. Right. Various things stopping the growth. Right, right. In 1967, you headed west to play with Electric Flag, and you uh, you joined Mike Bloomberg and a group of other very famous, now very famous blues players. And you guys, uh, you raided uh, Buddy Miles from Wilson Pickett, which is a funny story in itself. Uh, but what was the Electric Flag's music tradition? I'm just curious. The tradition of it was uh, take a combination of American music, uh, mostly R&B, uh, Otis Redding, James Brown, pattern our songs of, of those people, uh, some of the jazz musicians, uh, Horace Silver, John Coltrane. Take all of these music and make it American music. That was the concept. Um, and we, you know, in, along in that line, we had rhythm section and uh, started out with two horns, trumpet and tenor. And, you know, and that was the idea of so like a classic Horace Silver band or a sm or, or an Otis Redding kind of band. Um, that was that was kind of the, what the flag was about. Now you, uh, the group was plagued with drug problems. So, what was that the key to the end of Electric Flag, or what? Um, what happened there? It was the key to the end because the drugs became more important than the music. Uh, uh, when you get addicted to drugs got to get your drugs, you got to get your stuff. So you pull into a town, the first thing you do is you make connections for, your, uh, uh, for what you need. Heroin, whether it's cocaine, whether it's ups, downs. That's well, the was most. it Michael Bloomper a feel that had the worst drug problem of the group, or was it equally bad? Uh, that, you know, it, Michael had a lot of problems. Couldn't sleep. He had a chemical imbalance. It's a big part of it. Um, some of the guys were hardcore junkies that, that just had to do it, had to shoot. And uh, they couldn't play. They couldn't, you know, either they hated being where they were. I never understood it uh, because it's not something that I did. Um, uh, so uh, it, it led to the end of the band. You know, Michael couldn't. Mary Goldberg left the band because he wanted to get his life together. It was not helping. Um, right, right. So that so now really you guys went. You guys went on to Monterey Pop in '67, and what was it like performing there? I mean, that was a, a pivotal music event. That was amazing because it was our first real gig. We were like great born. Mentally, and, you know, we were nervous because, again, it was our first gig, and we're playing this pop festival. Um, and Michael was a, was a riot. He was up there saying stuff like, this is groovy, man. This is the grooviest thing we ever had. This is really groovy. He did about 10 minutes. Of that. He was so excited. And we were all like that. It was a beautiful uh, festival. 
everybody. So, was, what do you remember about other performances at, at Monterey Pop that sticks with you to this day? Well, I saw Otis Redding at his peak. My Duck Dunn, his bass player, was my favorite the guy I modeled myself after, Flag. Uh, they were fabulous. My Jimi Hendrix, who I knew from uh, Greenwich Village, uh, he came on and we were not ready for what he did. I was used to seeing him play the guitar behind his head and do his tricks, but uh, I was you know, maybe 10 feet away from him on stage to lit up that guitar. And uh, he was just unbelievable. Same thing, I had worked with uh, Murray the K, a guy named Arthur Gorsett, who was managing Murray the K. And they put on a show uh, at, uh, at the Lowy's Theater in Manhattan. The first Cream performance and the first Who performance. So I got to know the Who, uh, and then and Who played at uh, Monterey. Chill. They killed at Monterey. Did, did you know when you were there that this was going to be a historic concert? I mean, uh, was it obvious? Well, to me, it was, you know, I was just in this other place. I had come from New York and Queens playing clubs, sort of like in the, I won't say main, minor leagues, but, you know, in the bare existence leagues. And then all of a sudden, I got this gig with Dylan, and from that I became the, a bass player uh, in Hall, Manhattan, and I became the bass player at the Cafe of Gogo. -Go. And all these things started to happen. And so for me, right. wow. You know, just yeah, cool. yeah. Just cool. so now, the next, the next May, 1968, you went to L.A. to record Super Session. And that was another Al Cooper project. And on that record is a, a, a song called Harvey's Song. Uh, and... It, it was almost an accident that it got on there. But I'm wondering if you could tell us about how that happened and what it is that makes that record so timeless to this day. Well, the, uh, the thing about it was that the whole album was cut in two days. And it was like, it was kind of patterned after a Blue Note jazz album. You come in, and you perform, you play the performance, and that's it. Basically, it's not a lot of, although there were overdubbings, uh, there were overdubs on the album, not a lot. The rhythm sections were pretty much just done. And uh, it, there was a magic in it. Everybody clicked Bloomfield, you know, pulled the Bloomfield after the first day and vanished. But he laid down some great, you know, some great playing on what he did. And, and it was all spontaneous. Uh, same thing happened the next day with Steve Stills. Uh, so I think the album was one spontaneous. Two, uh, Cooper is a genius, getting it together and making it happen and keeping it going, uh, and not letting anything. You know, don't feel surprising him with the vanishing, and him having to come up with somebody, which he did, uh, was fabulous. Made the album spontaneous, interesting, and it's like a million sellers. Gold album, platinum album. You know, and we so all just it, had a great time. Yeah, at the end, though, you were short of songs, right? And, and, and what's the story on the Harvey song? How did that get on there? Well, Harvey was, uh, was a song. It was funny. I had been uh, maybe a year or so earlier in Malibu. Jim and Jean, both back. And I was staying at their house out in Malibu, and I wrote this song. You know, and they've been just hanging around. And I said, well, you know, this is a perfect opportunity. So I played them the song, sang the melody, and uh, everybody liked it. And it was it's the only uh, that kind of song. And Al took it to New York with Joey Scott. Uh, it was a great arrangement the horns on it, and uh, a lot of people love it. 
So, you know, wow. it's one of those things. One of those things about being in the right place at the right time with the right material, right? Uh, you, in May also of the same year, you met the Doors. And uh, it was a time when the group was not speaking with each other over disputes. Jim Morrison was separate from the other members. And you were hired to come in and in a way, bridge that gap. And you were able to do that. You were able to talk to each side and make it, the, it became the glue that held it together. What did you bring to the doors at that period that was so unique? Well, their producer, Paul Rothschild, who I had worked with before, um, he called me up. And I was in town, I was doing things that time, yes, Elliot also, and uh, called me up and he said, look, guys are you know, having some problems. He's had some big arguments over business, and he's got, kind of got in the way. And uh, Jim's not too happy. Dan's not too happy. you got to get this album done. And it's different material than they've done. They have to come up with something different. Uh, Paul Harris, your buddy Paul Harris is going to be strings and horns. And uh, so he, we had a meeting with Rothschild, Paul and myself, talking over the whole way, the whole method, which was me kind of bringing it together and making the rhythm section, you know, helping design the rhythm section so that for Paul, he's got what to work with, the horns and the strings all those kind of embellishments. So uh, that was it. You know, uh, most of the things were done. The tracks were done. Some took a few days to get uh, while the people sort of got themselves together. And I, and I would help them make little bridges to the sections. Um, and some of them worked out really well. Um, I think um, I, I was privy to hear Jim a few times trying to get his vocal things uh, on the tracks. Um, and uh, no, he wasn't a happy camper at that time. Uh, and I had learned not to really interact with him too much when he was in that mood. Uh, so, but other than that... But th this was one where your personality was almost as important as your musicianship, was it not? Because you were able to get along with these people. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I I was there because they respected what I did. So I'm dealing from a chair of respect. I was recruited. Robbie coming down, he had the electric flag, became a fan of the band. And he's a great guitar player and a great songwriter. So there's a lot of mutual respect going on. So I'm, I'm walking in, they're going to listen to what I'm saying. They're still going to do what they want. You know, I can soften somewhat so that everybody kind of relates. After this, you got involved with Cassa Elliot in, uh, in, in a, a show she was planning to do in Las Vegas. You stayed at her home in Laurel Canyon. Um, you had a lot of difficulty getting her to rehearse. Uh, and it ended up that the show was not particularly good. I wonder if you could maybe relate that experience of living there and what you went through with her. Cass was a beautiful person, really nice person. But she allowed herself to get involved. She wanted to be a center of attention. She wanted to be a person. And in doing so, she had a lot of gifts. You know, and she was very generous. People would come over and hang out. A lot of very talented people exchanging ideas. A lot of people that took advantage at the same time. Um, we had serious drug problems brought on by poor friends that would feed her. And, uh, 
didn't help her. Uh, she couldn't make rehearsals, tons of excuses. I was so sick and doing too much this, too much that. I'll be there tomorrow. It was an enormous band. We had arrangements. It was a lot. We needed a lot of rehearsal. And what was it like when you got to Las Vegas and the whole show kind of fell apart? What was uh, the scene there? Basically, when I came in charge, I was the band. He went to the orchestra. Um, we did one rehearsal on stage. She couldn't sing. There's no voice. And she appeared not to be worried about it. She went up to the restaurant, had some meals, and oh, uh, schmoozed with customers, and just like everything was fine. Uh, but it wasn't. Uh, that night, uh, you know, we kicked off the show, and she just wasn't there. Uh, and it meant a lot to her. You know, it's a shame that she got kind of taken advantage of. Uh, Shouldn't have done the show. Uh, her agent should have stopped the thing with her. Uh, wow. So, so that, that after was, this, yeah, yeah. After this, you become a producer at Columbia Records. And while there, you got the opportunity to record with Miles Davis. Um, what was it like working with him? And what did he tell you that he wanted to do? And what did he not tell you to do? Well, his main message was just be yourself. So, uh, I'm going to throw out a couple of ideas and just follow me. So, and there were a couple of tunes that had may have had a lick. But basically, it was a sound, you know, a C7 sound. That's what we're going to work on. He wanted me to put a bottom in, an electric bass, do, do, do this stuff. Dave Holland is playing acoustic bass, and Dave is a, a master. He's going to play all the beat, you know, all, all the melodic stuff. I, I, I'm just going to lock the thing in and give it a group. That was kind of. You know, Dave and I got along real well. Uh, we were listening to each other and, you know, and uh, helping each other. And, but basically, it's going. You know, Miles would stop. He'd stop the section, and he'd start this section. And uh, 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 he'd keep things going. Uh, I know that was basically the whole thing through the session. The beat of it happened. Editing, and and Tio. And, you know, they went through the stuff. They made it make sense. But so much of what we were doing was purely emotional. To make it uh, understandable, things had to be done. And I think that was an, an instrument unto itself. He went miles in the head. So now, now he, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Again, we're in a oh. delay here. Before there was electronic editing, before there was digital editing, they were tape. They were cutting tape and sticking things in. I mean, it was amazing what they did. You had a rehearsal at Miles' house, and he showed you a boxing film. Uh, what was that about, and what did that have to do with the music? Well, the closest I could come to, my estimation, would be that there was a spirit, there was an energy that really inspired Miles. He would watch it. I know this wasn't the first time he watched these films. And he'd be sparring with the film. And I think the whole idea of it was that it's, it's all a boxing match. No, it's Steve with the right, and you, cut, and you block, and then you come at your left, and you know, all these configurations of attacks. And, and 
comebacks and, and uh, all of this kind of stuff. And so you're you're reacting to the music that way. It's not what you expected. So you you hear it and then you react and come out with something else and that affects another player another way. Nobody's ever heard this before. So I think that was part of what his take on it was. Right. After the session's over, he invites you to perform live with him, and you turned it down, which to me is kind of hard to imagine. So what was what were you thinking? <laughs> well, when I was thinking, I was not confident with the jazz drums. You know, I felt like I was in the room with master masters that were incredible players. I consider myself master of what I know. Which my background is R B, folk music, pop music, you know, freedom of jazz, that issue area of chops. I was not confident. A mistake on my part. Because I was had I gone and done it, it would have just been the right thing. But, you know, instead, I had an album to produce, and I used that as an excuse. Right, right. I had the goods. Sometimes you make a wrong decision. Right, right. You described the bass player's job as to anchor the rhythm pattern and establish the harmony of the music. But it's clear through your career that you brought a lot more to it. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that, about how personality can affect music and how it worked in your favor. Uh, well, for me, uh, my, uh, my whole uh, take on music is that it is a joyous experience. Uh, something I do, I've done every day of my life. And in the times when I haven't done it, I have not been in good shape. So it's spiritually a, a part of, of who I am and what I do. It is, uh, I just bring, when I hear something, I listen and I, I absorb it. If, you, if I'm there, it's because you want Harvey Brooks to be there. So I'm going there with, with a mission. And that mission is to do what I do and make this music sound good. And make every player sound good. And make myself sound good. Have this, this incorporation of music come together. All these separate instruments. Register wise, low, high. Volume-wise, all of these things come into play. That's kind of like what I bring. That's what I think about. Right. You wrote that you never paid much attention to the music, to the business side of music, uh, and that that was a mistake. Could you explain so that people could understand what you meant by that? Well, you know, I... It was more important to me to take the gig. You know, not think about, well, is it a contract? What's, what's the terms? How long? You know, I, I just took the gig and went. And so not demanding a contract, I didn't get one. Not, to, not uh, creating the parameters of the business, there was none. Uh, so my incredible wife, Bonnie, has straightened me out over the years about thinking you know, and encompassing you know, what it is you're doing. You, know, if you have to place value on what you do on yourself and not just throw it away because everybody's happy to pick up what's thrown at you. Just use it. And right. You can't make a living. You can't make a real serious living. Right, so, right. I guess today you could never get away with that kind of uh, lack of business acumen. No, no, you can't. Not, 
Well, the same way you can't use the sound system back then. It's outdated. That formula is over. You know, it's all evolved. And now musicians have to be aware of what it is. If you're going to get somebody to work with you, it has to be somebody that you trust. Right, somebody right. That you love, that you trust. Or the tech. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You have a lot of money. You know, and you're going to have somebody watch them. Uh, though technology has changed dramatically in music over the years, uh, it's the artistry that still matters the most. And um, I guess I'm wondering, in, in the realm of playing bass, how do you see um, that artistry as the dominant thing to this day? Well, okay. I'm a bass player first, but I'm also a guitar player. I'm also a piano player. I won't call myself a piano player. I'm a piano composer. I can write. To me, it's all about content. The, if you don't have what to play, it doesn't really matter. You have to have what to play. And, uh, I'll rephrase the question a second. Well, I, I, I guess what I was wondering is it, 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 if it's the artistry rather than the technology. A lot of people today think of technology, since they can record at home, as being an essential thing. But in a way, music hasn't changed that much over the years. And uh, you have brought something far more than technology to this, though you play the electric bass, and that is a form of technology. But I, I, I wondered, you know, really what you felt about the, the technical changes that have happened over the years. I think, I think what's happened, you go back, in the early days, we had 78 records, somebody singing a song, and it would go out to the public, that would be a hit record or not. But that was the way. It was one song, uh, an A side and a B side that nobody cared about. It evolved. It evolved technologically. It evolved into two track, four track, eight track, sixteen track, thirty two track recording, allowing the composer, the musician, to use to have more tools at his fingertips to be creative to add more interest. Uh, instruments to have control over his, each instrument's value, uh, to bring something in, to bring something out. All this technology kept evolving, kept evolving. And now the technology is at the point where you or I, any person in their house, create with technology a sound that sounds clear, full, you can hear every part of it cost you 30 bucks as opposed to $40,000 the studio and instead of hiring an orchestra do it with digital players or a couple of guys they all play a bunch of them. Now what has happened is there are a lot of bandwagons of songs. There are certain kind of songs with certain progressions that are hits. About a hundred of them. They use the same chords Similar melody. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are amazing jazz musicians, classical musicians, who have grown up playing, learning how to play with methods that by the time they were eight, they already mastered the instrument. And by 16, you know, they were, like, their parents were worried that they were going to have a life. Right? They only going to be this amazing musician. There's all these kind of sides to it. Then there's the like who've been around a long time, still doing it, still being creative. What do I do? I use all of those years of technology that I've learned about. Now I'm, I'm a digital guy. I record, and I also record analog. I believe in finding it all. Uh, but that's kind of that's kind of what it is. I, mean, I think. 
for today's musician, you've got to be everything. There are like our niches. This, this type of music that sounds a certain way, this kind of music, classical, jazz, all these things, uh, country music, there's country pop, and all of this stuff. And like I say, guys like me, we're, we're still doing, like I, I've, I've gone through a lot of blues music, I play a lot more jazz now, a lot of free feeling music. And at the same time, I'm, I'm playing new kind of jazz, new kind of blues, I should say. I'm in the middle of a project that I'm working on now. And what is it? It's, it's some of it's blues. Some of it is uh, I don't know what what it is, but I'm you know, I'm still doing it. That's that's kind of where I'm. At. Right, right. Uh, one final question. You spent a lot of time on this book and a lot of self-reflection because I know I, we, I was involved with you doing it. I'm wondering, now that it's over, what, what did you learn about yourself? Well, boy, I'll tell you one thing. It's the most soul-bearing experience you can You can find out how really stupid you can be. You can find out you know, that you know, you've done a lot of bad shit. Obviously, you've done some, a lot of good things. You've also done a lot of bad things. Hurt people. People have hurt you. And you, and you go through all of this stuff. You know, I, I learned how lucky I was uh, to meet my wonderful, incredible wife, Molly, who basically saved my life. Being a loving person. Uh, wow. This day, wow. I'm working trying to live up to her. You know, and, Having a guy like Frank, who I'm talking to right now, who just like helped just put it in, made it make sense, and talk to people. But it was an incredible experience. And boy, I'm glad I wouldn't want to do it again, you know. Maybe in another hundred years or two. I've developed enough information. It was an incredible trip. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of us. Right. Right. Book. So the book it the book is called View from the Bottom, which is uh, a wonderful title to take on a base. And uh, it's now, I think, out on Kindle as well, I think as of today. So if you can download it instantly, and uh, it's, it's a good way to read books for people that uh, don't want to own the book. Uh, and Oh, okay, great. Great. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Harvey, before we leave? Um, no, I, 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 just, I, I just have to thank my wife, Bonnie, for uh, being an incredible self and helping me become the person that I am and to accomplish good and do my dreams and make them come true. The third one, if I say the real first one, sorry. the other two are this book and an album. So. Well, thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. Good luck with the book, and uh, we'll speak again soon. We will. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.